really great to have you here as a participant in this gathering presented by the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. I'm Jennifer Goodman, the executive director, and um, pleased that my colleague Nicole Flynn, who's our field service representative, is also here from the Preservation Alliance. Um, and so I don't forget, I also want to introduce um, George Bourne, who's the historic resources um, specialist and at the um, LCHIP, the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program. Really great to have him with us today, too, as part of that, representing that really important historic preservation and land conservation grant program. Um, I think a lot of you know that um, these kind of gatherings are really important to us and hopefully important to you as a way to help folks like you at work in communities trying to rescue and revitalize and steward these special places we can't imagine our communities without. Um, Preservation Alliance does a lot of different kinds of activities, but we feel that these educational sessions are important and hope you do too. Um, this the model of sort of bringing in an outside expert like Betsy McNamara, hearing from her and hearing from all of you, uh, I think is, is both enjoyable and we've seen it be very effective too. And our goals today are really about um, offering some, uh, some context, some facts that you can use to help frame your priorities uh, hopefully that everybody leaves with a few more new good ideas and also a, a dose of inspiration to move your projects forward. Um, I think some of you know Betsy, Betsy uh, McNamara from Full Circle Consulting, uh, a great person to help us accomplish this today. And, and as Jenna had an incredible impact in her work um, around New Hampshire. Um, we got to know her when she was um, managing the campaign to help save Diamond Hill Farm in Concord. Uh, she's also kind of at the other end of the process, helped us with a um, feasibility study that was very helpful. I think some of you have met her as she's done presentations in the past for us at conferences, and some of you have probably worked with her or had a chance to talk to her too. So, so happy that she's here with us to um, share what she knows and answer your questions today. Um, so we've got a great expert, and I think we also have a great group. Um, I know a lot of you are involved in all different kinds of historic preservation work around the state. Um, we're not gonna ask everybody to introduce themselves, but I thought I'd ask two questions with two choices each, just so we could get a sense of the room as it were. Um, so um, the first is sort of your prime focus on what you're fundraising for right now. And my options are going to be bricks and mortar kind of projects, the rescue rehabilitation kind of projects, or other educational or ongoing kind of operating costs. So I'm going to be old fashioned and ask for a show of hands. So the two choices, bricks and mortar or all the other stuff, how many people are working on a bricks and mortar project right now? Okay. Um, and the others, some of I, I guess we can tell who the others are. <laughs> um, and then I just wanted to ask about sort of experience or longevity. Uh, my choices are newcomer versus kind of long timer, somebody who has some uh, previous campaign or sort of substantial fundraising experience under their belt. How many people feel pretty experienced? Okay, newcomers, show yourselves. All right, that's a nice mix. So again, I think the format of this should help helpfully lends itself to everybody getting something out of it, even if you're at different points in a campaign or looking for different kinds of dollars out there for historic preservation. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Betsy now. She's gonna kick it off and um, spend about a half of this program, a little less than half, and then we'll open it up to really um, get your, qu your questions and your own advice or tips. Betsy? Hi. I had a moment there, I wasn't allowed to unmute. Thanks, uh, Jennifer, and um, uh, it's great to see you all. And I appreciate you having me here. I um, have been fundraising in New Hampshire for over 30 years and worked with a lot of nonprofits, large and small on fundraising campaigns ranging from uh, annual operating uh, uh, campaigns to very well, relatively large capital campaigns, not Dartmouth College large, but for New Hampshire um, uh, community based nonprofits large. So um, I, uh, when I when I talk with folks from nonprofits, I get very similar questions from many of them. And 
here they are. So tell me if you think that these resonate with you. The first one is where do I find donors and how do I identify them? The second one is how do I get them to care about my organization or my project? The third one is what's the best way to ask them for money? One more recent question is what's changed since the pandemic started? And then the final question is some variation of why is this so difficult? So um, what I'd like to do today is do an overview of fundraising. And for some of you who've been doing this for a while, it might not all be new information, but it might, might be a refresher. Some of it might be new. <clears throat> the overview I'm gonna provide you with today, and I'm gonna switch over to PowerPoint in a moment, is who are the donors and what do they tend to give to? Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what motivates donors to give, why they give, what are some basic rules of fundraising? <clears throat> and then uh, we're gonna dip into what has changed and what has not changed because of the pandemic. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna cross my fingers that this goes well. Can you see it? Yay, okay. So this is the, this is the answer to the question of who gives and to what. Every year, um, the um, Giving USA report comes out that, that is a, a national report on who are donors and what they support. So as you can see here, 69% of all philanthropic giving in 2020 came from individuals. Now, if you add bequests to that, bequests are of course planned gifts that occur after a person passes away usually, um, that total is 76%. And what I'd like to point you to is the 19% of gifts that come from foundations. That number has been increasing steadily in the past 15 or so years, up from about 10, 11% to now a full 19%. And the reason there is because of the um, surge in popularity of donor advised funds. We in New Hampshire know donor advised funds from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. You might also have received for your organization something from Fidelity, uh, a check from a donor advised fund. So Fidelity, Schwab, the Charitable Foundation, Community Foundations in general, all have donor advised funds. And what a donor advised fund is, is it allows you to, here, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. A donor advised fund allows you to, a donor, say, pretend you sold your family business for $10 million. You want to, and by the way, it's good tax planning to give a chunk of it away in the year in which you make the sale. Um, but you can't really think of what to give it all away to. You just weren't prepared to do that. So you can set up a donor advised fund with a foundation like the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation or Fidelity has set them up. You put your say 2 million in there, you get the tax write off that year and then it sits there waiting for you to make a decision. So this has become a very popular way of giving. And the bottom line then is that estimates are, I'm gonna share my screen again, estimates are that 82 to 85% of all philanthropic giving comes from individuals. And that's a combination of outright giving, bequests, planned gifts, and then donor advised fund giving. So this is all to say, um, I, a lot of times I will work with nonprofits who say, well, we wanna ask all the businesses in our community. And that's when I point them to this, just 4% of, of all philanthropic giving comes from businesses. So it's, it's not, when you're looking for the biggest bang for your buck, it's, it's not the place. Now, where does it go? Again, from Giving USA, um, it goes, the, by, by far the vast majority of, of giving in the United States goes to religious organizations, followed closely by education, followed by human services. This 12% gifts to grant making foundations is up significantly um, over previous years, especially over a decade ago, that used to be one to 2%. That's our donor advised funds showing their head again. But also I think last year you saw with COVID, you saw the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, for example, and I think foundations did this, community foundations did this across the country. They created a special fund and asked people to donate to it and people responded. So that's another reason why that showed up. Um, 
I point you to arts, culture, and humanities, just 4%. One could argue that preservation could be under public society benefit or arts, culture, and humanities. Either way, they're relatively small slices of the pie. And that is important to know so that you understand what you're facing. This is an interesting thing, how, how giving has changed. And after this, I promise I'm done with charts. Um, how, how giving has changed in the past two years. What the gold is last year, 2019 to 2020, and the blue is 2018 to 2019. So we, what we saw is that foundations did a huge increase in giving. Uh, this is changes in giving by source. Whereas individuals increased only by 1%, the total giving overall was more than last year. Um, corporations went way down in 2020. Bequests, I found this really kind of a dark humor type thing, went up significantly. So, um, and then this is changes in the type of, of recipient organization because in 2020, because of the pandemic. So again, the gold is, is last year. Um, we saw human services do a very big increase and public society benefit do a very large increase. Arts, culture, and humanities had a decrease, a significant decrease. So um, again, this, this we'll be talking about messaging later and this is, this is the, the climate we're in right now. Um, I would like to, Ooh, I didn't tell um, you guys, Jennifer and Nicole, that I was going to do this. Um, I wanted to ask some questions. So Nicole, I need to ask you to unmute folks. I'm wondering, when we think about why donors give, I like to ask the question back at you, which is, when you think about a time that you made a personal contribution and you felt good about it, what was going on there? Why? Why do you think you felt good about it? Just try and just try and think about that. Nicole, can you unmute folks? People can unmute themselves. Now you can unmute yourselves. Great. Okay. Anybody? They are asked. Excellent. You can use the chat as well. Yes. That is a surprisingly basic one that people don't think about. I felt that it was something that was personal to me. Mm -hmm. In the sense that you had a personal connection or an experience with it? Both, actually. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, very good. And then somebody wrote, personal connection, scouting children, want to leave a good legacy. There was a sense of urgency. You guys are very good. All right. I'm going to go to my next slide. Um, oops. And this is what the literature shows. They were asked just the number one reason. I've done a lot of campaigns um, and I can only think of one time where an unexpected unasked for gift came in um, that, that moved the needle on the campaign. People give to people. You guys already, you, you touched on this. This is two things. One is if somebody that you respect and like asks you to give to an organization that you don't know too much about, you're probably, you might give, not because you've done a ton of research on the organization, because, but because you respect that person you trust that they have. Also, it's hard to say no to somebody you respect and like. Uh, the other thing about people give to people is that personal connection and this goes into the next one, the personal commitment to the organization or issue. So if you see a story, and studies show this, if you see a story about, not you, if any one of us, this is human nature, sees a story about a village of starving children in, in an emerging country, and you're asked to give help so that those children can be fed, that's a less effective way to ask than if, you hi if the organization highlights one child. And you, as you are giving, you feel that we, we as donors, as we are giving, we feel that, okay, I can see the impact. I can look at that one child and, and visualize my gift going to feed that one child. 
So people give to people is, is twofold. Personal commitment to the organization or issue. If um, you have a, well, Concord has, has a great example of a very successful, very energizing uh, walk in support of breast cancer research. And um, people are there because they have loved ones or they have personally experienced breast cancer. So that's an example of a personal commitment to an issue. You might have um, your own experience of having grown up in an old home or in a community with um, beautiful older buildings. And so you have that personal commitment and that personal experience. Uh, it's a reason why our colleges, sorry about that, our colleges do so well. Um, they have we have a personal commitment. If, we, if you went to college, especially if you lived there or a boarding school, for example, you have a real commitment to that or, or you have a real experience with that organization and that organization can then touch on that uh, as a way to keep you engaged. Um, they can see the impact. Ha have you ever been asked to make a gift and then feel like, well, my $25 is just not gonna do anything for this, for this giant problem. How can I, how can I, uh, it's, it just isn't worth it. Or you make a gift and then you don't hear from them at all. So you don't know if it made a difference. If this campaign to, um, if this campaign to say the hospital is buying a new piece of equipment and if they make, if they don't circle back to you and say, we bought it and here's the impact, that, that would be hard for you to give again. And that connects very closely with donors feel appreciated. So the reasons why people don't give or I never got acknowledged. I couldn't see, I couldn't tell what the money did. They didn't seem to care. I was not communicated with. So moving on, some basic rules of fundraising. One is um, capacity plus interest equals gift. And I'm gonna use the example of this guy. A lot of people think about Bill Gates as as somebody to ask, the Gates Foundation. Now, what, what does he have? He has capacity, we all know that. And all in our communities, we know people who have capacity. The question is, do they have the interest? Do they care about your organization? Uh, another rule, this is the 80-20 rule. So this means that 80% of your gifts come from 20% of your donors. Now I'm gonna go a little deeper into this because that's what the rule was when I started my career 30 years ago. It then moved to the 90-10 rule. And more recently, it is the 95-5 rule. And this is a big deal in philanthropy. People are writing books about it. This, is, this means that a very, very small group of people are making the decisions about our, our nonprofits. And in fact, million dollar gifts are becoming more common, but where do they tend to go? They tend to go to foundations, to colleges, to hospitals. There are those donor advised funds, museums, that sort of thing. Um, youth groups in this year, uh, it was a 2019, only one $1 million gift in the whole country. So you see that the consternation or the concern in philanthropy, and this is a challenge I think for philanthropy, is that very, very wealthy people are driving uh, how nonprofits do and what they can focus on. Because of course, we as donors all give to support something that we care about and what our interests are. Another basic rule of fundraising, your best prospective donor is your current donor. So a nonprofit should always be looking to find the next new donor but you're gonna have the best success with somebody who has already proven that they have both the capacity and the interest to make a gift to you. And that is your current donor. So spending time, thanking them, appreciating them, letting them know of the impact of their gift is critical work. Um, there is a pyramid, you've probably all heard of this, the pyramid. Uh, what you might not know is that the folks who give um, who are the occasional givers and the event participants or the annual donors, there might be a critical mass of donors. There might be a lot of donors there, but the amount of money to the organization is going to be relatively small. This is another way of saying 
that 95% of philanthropy is coming from 5% of donors. So the money increases the higher up you go on the giving pyramid. And where I see organizations stumble in terms of running afoul of this, this pyramid and of the 95-5 rule is when you start out a campaign with a letter to everybody in town. Because you've, you've asked people to give their 25 bucks, you might raise $15,000 if you're lucky from a mailing. And then people feel like, well, I gave, why isn't it done? Instead, what you should do or what a nonprofit is best advised to do is to approach your major donors uh, first and get to 80 or 90% of your fundraising goal before you send a letter out to all of your donors. There is a donor cycle. Have you guys seen this? You will have to identify, this is the find the donor thing. Cultivate, that simply means trying to encourage their interest. Solicitation, that's the ask. That is often the smallest part of this whole relationship cycle. And then stewardship, and what that simply means is thanking them and thanking them again, letting them know the impact of their work. So where do you find your donors? This is, I, I'm using a concept known as Rosso's concentric circle in, in fundraising. You always start with those closest to you. And who are those closest to you? The people on your board, the people who are already major givers, uh, the people who are already very connected to your organization. Then you move outward. You might approach annual fund donors or people who've come to your whatever programs you have in your organization. And then you move outward again. But to, to try and raise money from people that you don't know if they have a connection or not, is just, it's, it's the least effective way to fundraise. You really, you have to start with the people you know are connected and have that interest. And then we're back to this phrase, people give to people. Again, it's, it matters who is the person asking. This is for a, a large gift that should always be done in person or by Zoom, which can be very effective. Um, and telling stories about the impact on people in your community, very effective. So, um, Fundraising in a pandemic. We've been doing this now for about 18, what, 19 months. Um, I would say, and I said this, uh, Jennifer and I spoke last week and I realized I had done a presentation in April of, of 2020. We were all just figuring things out. And this is what I said then and, it's, and I say it now, the fundamentals of fundraising are the same. You need to identify, build and sustain relationships with the people that support you. You have to communicate with them and communicate and communicate. That's probably even more important these days since it's harder to get together in person. And uh, demonstrate, when you're communicating, demonstrate the impact of their gift on your, on your mission. And you have to ask. Um, some people worry about asking in, in this kind of crisis climate we're in right now. But again, there are people who care about your organization and they want to ask. So, um, I'm gonna stop sharing because I wanna get into this a little bit. So what's different, I would say, is the messaging needs to be a little different. I think um, you wanna acknowledge what's going on in the community. You can't ignore it. You can't be tone deaf about it, but you also um, need to convey urgency in a way probably that it's probably even more important to convey a bit of urgency since we are all fundraising in a climate of people trying to meet basic needs like food and shelter for people who've been impacted by the economic downturn. Um, the other thing I would say is different is delivery. People have really successfully moved online to digital. I mean, look at us, a year and a half ago, I never occurred to me I would be doing presentations <laughs> um, online and now I'm finding it quite effective and efficient. I have found that fundraising via Zoom is actually really effective. There's this kind of odd sort of intimacy of being so, you don't sit this close to somebody in person, right? Um, so, uh, and folks are more and more looking for online digital communication. 
Uh, they're just, we're all more used to it now. So that's, that's incumbent on the organization. It gives you opportunity to do quick updates, say on a social media page or on your website. Um, so that, that I would say is it for me. I, I welcome questions. I'm really intending this. This is a shortened version of what I can do in a, in a four hour workshop. So um, I encourage you to ask questions. I was really intending it as a jumping off point and an overview for you to, for you to um, ask me questions and, and get a basic understanding. So I have some questions that could start us off or does anybody have any kind of big picture questions they wanna ask Betsy? You can, and as Nicole reminds us, I think you can just go to your upper corner and mute yourself, unmute yourself, sorry. Oh, Ian, I think has a question. Ann, do you wanna go first and then we'll ask uh, Aaron's question out loud. Ann, you have to unmute yourself. There you go. Nope, you double clicked it. <laughs> I think you double clicked it. We can't hear you. There you go. Okay. Yep. Okay. My question is, how do you get it all done? Oh, that's all an excellent very question. very well and good. Perfectly laid out. Perfect think... primer. How do you do it all? Yeah. How this is get... the why is it so difficult part. Um, it's exactly right. Are you with an all volunteer organization? No, we have okay. a considerable staff. Oh, great. But, but our, vol our development department, is, I'm chair of the development and whether we have one um, uh, part-time coordinator yeah. and, and the ED who balances a zillion things. Right. So uh, the answer to that is you prioritize. And what we've learned today, and this is, this is hard, uh, what we've learned today is um, that uh, most money comes from individuals in the form of major gifts. And so whatever you can do to identify folks in your community who are the, the regional Bill Gates of your community and get them interested and invested and then find the right person who can ask them to give, that's going to be the big bang for your buck. The question, though, is do you have a price? That's harder to do for annual fund you know, ongoing program support, that's a little easier to get for major gifts are very often for a big step forward or a bricks and mortar kind of project. So prioritizing a big theme, how about the, the who? Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? I think there's been, a, you know, all volunteer or with staff, you struggle with who can be on your development committee, even create, would you, can you even create a development committee? Um, do you have any reaction to that, uh, Betsy? Yeah, the who I think is, well, first you start with your board and uh, does everybody on your board make a gift to the organization? That is critical. And yes. some organizations have a minimum that they're upfront with when they recruit. Others say, please give, please make us one of your top few gifts, you know, put us in your top three annually. Um, and, that, and then if, they're giving, if you're doing a bricks and mortar campaign, you want to ask them over and above that. And every, again, everybody needs to give that. So I'm doing a small campaign right now. It's not for a preservation group, social service agency, but everybody on the board gave everybody. And we asked them for a minimum of 2,500, but some, one person gave a six figure gift and probably the smallest gift was 500. So the point is you have to, you have to look to your board to, to really be the nucleus. And mm -hmm. after that, you go out to people who are, already, who are already giving to you. And when you're asking for big gifts, the most effective way is to do it in person. So this is very time consuming, that's the problem. It's, it is tough, I would, um, somebody's talking about influencers. That, that reminds me, the next thing to do is ask people on your board who they might know. And this is where you have to sort of go step by step in building relationships. Has any of you ever done um, a house party, for example? Very common in political, for political candidates, but um, it's also very effective for nonprofits. It raises awareness. It, um, uh, there's an intimacy there. Um, and usually the host is the one who's willing to follow up either by phone or by mail saying, 
will you please support this project? And our work lends itself very well to that, to going to do something intimate in a, a great place, whether it's the actual place you're trying to raise money for or somebody's house that's nearby or something like that. Um, I, I think the who is hard in terms of who's doing the work. It can feel hard. I've been, I've been um, uh, impressed over the years at people who had no fundraising experience at all, but were passionate about the project and were with some support from somebody else on the committee who had done fundraising before willing to step in. Um, and Anne, I think sort of <laughs> taking time to sort of celebrate your progress is really important too, whether you're working on a really long campaign or you're trying to do annual fund year in and year out, just like taking the time to uh, know that you're, you're moving along and you're hitting targets and keeping the, the energy up for sure. Um, we have a bunch of chats. Um, just learned, so you were referring to that one, Betsy, do you wanna to react to that at more, the, the influencer ones or? I don't really understand that, but um, this does get to the, the theme of fundraising, which is you can't just have anybody pick up the phone and call somebody or say, can we meet? It has to be somebody that donor knows and respects. Uh, same thing in if you're sending out a mailing, it has to be somebody who's known in the community. Uh, just like we no longer answer our phones unless we know the number, right? We, um, we, people just don't respond to people who, that they don't know. Um, I had another thought, but it just left my head. There's the, um, what's the reality for doing these complex ideas, I guess, meaning your suggestion um, from Aaron, uh, but, but I think some of it goes back to what you were telling Anne about prioritizing. Do you have any more about kind of the practical reality of all of this? Um, so here's a question. How many, I mean, how many people have, how many organizations have had small events at your property, at your, at your site that you're trying to save? So that's a pretty, you know that. Oh. And then the question is following up on those people. So can you divide up, I mean, again, these are simple and I get this a lot when I'm consulting. Okay, I know what I should be doing, but finding the time to do it is, is very different. But yeah. sometimes what happens is we, again, human nature, focus on the things that are easy to us. But the most effective thing to do is after you have that event, say 15 people are there, divide it up. So each person on your committee calls four of them or three of them. And just ask the question, what'd you think? Uh, are you enthused? Is this something you think you, or would you be willing to meet with me to talk further, more about it and what this means for our community? I think that um, the messaging these days, this is what came back to me. This is what I was gonna say. The messaging these days is really important. You have to focus on why, why this matters to the community in a time of COVID. And I can think of reasons, you know, people are, I don't know your projects. So for, forgive me if I'm either stating the obvious or missing the mark about your specific project. But this is a time when people are really wanting to be grounded in their community. They're wanting, they are seeking solace in nature and perhaps in history. You know, you can talk about, this is a community gathering spot. This is a, a, uh, resource. This is a peaceful reminder of how life was in these turbulent times. Um, I think acknowledging where we are right now as a society and putting your project in that context is really important. It adds to the urgency. It answers the question that donors might have while I really, or their concern, I really should be giving to the food pantry because that's what people really need right now. It helps them to, to expand their thinking. Oh, this is important too in the midst of a pandemic and economic crisis, so. No, that's great, great points. Solace is a great word, longevity, community gathering. Um, people are, you know, people are either busy or distracted and even more on kind of high alert and need to be uh, given those opportunities where people are working at home and have a little more time. So they're looking around their community more. Um, and there are some nice kind of public health 
psychological health things related to beauty and community spaces and things that I think are also important to sh share. And John, yeah. and John, and John, I was just going to say, yeah. I would, I would, I would talk about the economic impact, and I, I think LCHIP is focused on this too. You know, what is the economic impact of open space in our communities? Um, we, New Hampshire, saw a huge jump in usage of its hiking trails. Yeah. I think there are a lot of people who have been instead of traveling across the country, they're getting in their car and driving around New England and perhaps visiting old buildings. And what, what does that mean for your downtown? Right. People looking for that respite in rural places and small towns and that's right. vibrant downtowns. Yeah, that's sort of our hiking trails equivalent, I think. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody asked, Go ahead. Sorry. Well, somebody asked about how do you find grants? Um, you, there aren't, let me just say, uh, New Hampshire is unusual. We don't have a ton of grant makers. And again, I'm going to go back to that. Uh, many, many, many are either family foundations or are uh, from a donor advised fund. But you, you can look up grants on um, the foundation center has a really nice, a really robust database. There are databases. If you're a member of the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits, you have access to their grant search engine. Um, Foundation Center has a, a, a free version that's okay. And then if you want the full, the full really expensive version, you can borrow it from uh, Plymouth State Library. Or if you're close to the Massachusetts border, there are some right over the line and there are some in Boston and, and Portland, I think. So uh, there are search engines that you can use, but we know the, many of us who've been fundraising for a long time know the usual suspects, you know, the Samuel P. Hunt Foundation, the Von Weber Trust. Maybe this is a minute to let George just say a couple minutes worth. If, if, That'd uh, be great. Speaking of grants. Speaking of grants, <laughs> I represent a funder. I'm George Bourne. I'm the Historic Resource Specialist at uh, New Hampshire's Land and Community Heritage Investment Program, otherwise known as LCHIP. And we provide matching grants um, to communities and nonprofits seeking to preserve historic buildings. Um, we fund um, mostly restoration and rehabilitation projects, but we also fund planning studies and the occasional acquisition project as well. Um, our program is a matching grant program. So for every, at least for every dollar that LCHIP contributes to a project, uh, there has to be a, a local contribution from the recipient um, of an equal value. Um, and I say equal value because we do allow up to half of the match can be in non-cash sources. And so I encourage recipients to, um, and applic potential applicants to think about non-cash sources of value that can help um, move your project along, volunteer labor, volunteer uh, services, volunteer materials that are donated, um, uh, things like that. Um, in, our, in LCHIP selection criteria, um, it, projects do rank higher if there is uh, more leverage, that is to say <laughs> more, more, more money and more funding sources that help match the state dollar. Um, so, you know, the one-to-one the, the -one match is, a, is the absolute uh, minimum, but you're certainly encouraged to uh, put in more. <laughs> um, and we've got some LCHIP veterans here, Dennis McClary from Langdon and uh, Ruth Gutman. And uh, we've got some potential. We've got Richard House is in the mix this year and uh, Kip Webb, you're a veteran too. So with an open grant wrapping up. So um, it's been a useful program. Um, some of the chat mentions the Moose Plate Conservation and Preservation Grant Program. That has proven to be um, for publicly owned, that is to say, resources that are owned by municipalities in New Hampshire, a useful source of match for LCHIP grants. Um, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. And uh, now <laughs> Ooh. I'll announce it here that we're lucky through a partnership with the 1772 Foundation that we are going to have a new round of grant funds for small matching grants um, for nonprofit for nonprofit organizations. So that should get posted on our website next week. Um, but let's go back to the individuals again. 
And and what you, the points you were making, Betsy, about the community found the donor advised funds. How do you counsel people? Um, is it are you still going through the front door and meeting with the individual to have access to those dollars? Is that a point you want to make? Yes. Today? Thanks for saying that. Um, you, the thing about donor advised funds, and this is by design. Uh, the donor doesn't really want to be found, or they want all the back office stuff to be managed by the charitable foundation or fidelity. Again, it's a very elegant solution. Uh, it, as a fundraiser, it makes it harder to find people who have money because their resources are through the donor advised fund. Um, so, but if you know people who you know have capacity, it doesn't really matter where the check comes from, right? So, or the gift, it's whether it's their family foundation, their individual checking account or their donor advised fund. The, co the point is to, to make that connection and build that interest with them. Uh, and sometimes you'll receive a gift that's a combination of all three. So it is not, you can't research donor advised funds. You can't, you can't really find them. So uh, it's just knowing the people in your community who are likely to have capacity. Okay. I saw a question about grant funders for municipalities. So if you're working on behalf of a municipality, I would say not just for grants, but for individuals as well. You're right foundations won't usually give to a public entity and individuals really do like the um, tax deduction because why not um, that comes with a, a gift to a 501c3 so I suggest either finding a fiscal agent or establishing your own 501c3 uh, friends of charity most public libraries have a friends of uh, many hospitals have that as well if they're public publicly owned hospitals so it's a really effective way to be able to accept um tax deductible gifts donor advised funds will also not give to they only give to 501c3s um a fiscal agent for those of you who don't know is when you have an arrangement with a 501c3 hopefully it's one that's sort of along the lines i don't know jennifer do you do you have suggestions of fiscal agents for regional um, we ask people to look around and look for, we suggest people look around for sort of mission aligned organizations that, okay. um, that accept that kind of role. Yeah. I and think so, it varies project to project. Yeah. And so the, the fiscal agent is then responsible. They're basically taking on the responsibility of accepting the gifts and, um, the responsibility of making sure that the money is used for what you say it's going to be used for. And um, usually they take a fee, three to two to four percent, usually, of of the total amount that's given. But then they're responsible for producing all the the fiscal reports and things like that. Favorite uh, pandemic era things that people have tried. Um, I, I liked your point, Betsy, about how Zoom does give you this different sort of intimacy. It's I always think it's really hard on the phone because you can't see people or read body language in person feels great, but, um, but your Zoom option is a good one to promote. Um, going on a walk with somebody or sitting on their porch together can be really nice, <laughs> sort of less um, formal than trying to eat lunch at the same time you're talking to somebody and waiting to make the ask um, or just telling stories can feel easier, I think, in that more informal kind of feeling setting, I mean. A yep, porch or a walk. I agree. Yeah. Jennifer, yeah. Um, I just wanted to tell just a quick story about a recent visit I made to um, Sutton, visit the South Sutton Meeting House, which is owned by the Sutton Historical Society. And I, uh, they're an LCHIP recipient now. And I asked them at midpoint how their project is coming along and uh, how they're managing through the pandemic. And they actually said their donations went up during the pandemic. And that, of course, prompted me to ask, you know, why and how, <laughs> how did you do that? Um, but they said that the, the Zoom option, not only the Zoom, uh, wasn't an option, we, we all went on Zoom, um, forced them to look beyond um, in-person events that only drew from a fairly, you know, very local regional mm -hmm. area. And they found that with their Zoom, so Old Home Day had to be canceled, but they had a sort of a Zoom equivalent. And people who were in California and all over who had moved away or who had summered there or you know, hadn't been back in years tuned in and gave to their meeting house restoration uh, project. So um, 
I, there's there are some really heartwarming stories about <laughs> managed to survive and thrive in the nonprofit sector uh, in these difficult times. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Yeah, Other yeah. people, questions, suggestions, tips, myths, things you're worried about. <laughs> Jennifer, if I can add something, um, a lot of uh, corporations now are taking advice from their employees on who to donate to. So a lot of them will do a one for one match to donations up to a certain amount that the employees do, or they're offering um, paid time to volunteer for an organization. And sometimes that can count as a match. Um, I know some tech companies even give a cash equivalent to the nonprofit for the salary of the time that the person volunteered. So those are things to consider and ask your, your members and your, your board members to see if their companies do those things. That's great. Hmm. Yeah, and that engaging people on a, on a work day is, a, is not only a great way to get a lot of work done in a short period of time, but it's also a really great way to, um, to cultivate, to, to raise interest in. If somebody's spending the whole day working on your landscaping, they're gonna feel some investment in your <laughs> organization. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Hmm. Um, what other kinds of things? I'm sure everybody is looking around for the successful projects around them and who the donors with were sort of similar projects and looking for <laughs> prospects from that. It's, it goes to your, it's a version of your concentric circle point, Betsy, is uh, where else has there been success and is there, are there lessons learned for you or people or individuals or donors or partners for you? Um, if you're working on the meeting house, what happened at the library kind of thing? Um, yeah, and I, I can't understate um, how important it is to communicate with folks. And back to your point, Anne, about, well, when do we have time for this? It's, it's really a question of sending out an email or posting something on social media. I, and it's as simple as, um, you know, if you take a pretty picture of your building at sunset or sunrise, post it on social media engage people in, in uh, their appreciation of the beauty of this property. That's good. Take a stack of note cards to every board meeting and divide up your list. That was back to what somebody said earlier. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Yes, our board does do that. Excellent. For on the thank you side or the cultivation side or both? No, on the thank you side. Yeah. That's great. It's very, very effective. And it's not a hard, heavy lift for, for board members. Yeah. I serve on two boards and, and both ask us to do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Anything anybody is afraid to ask that they want to put in the chat? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I was interested in the comment about historic restoration. Uh, I'm a part of a board trying to fundraise to get a building for an historical society. And that's, we're a small historical society. Um, the building we are in is being kind of loaned to us and we've seriously outgrown it. We can't take any more donations. There's not room to store them. There's not space to display. So we really need a building. But again, we're a small society. So I'm looking at this and this is a big deal for our little group. Okay. To acquire a new building, a to new own building. New building. And uh, it would be nice to get together with other historical societies. Is there a way to do that and say, you know, how are you? Yeah, doing? I mean, we love putting people together and, you know, either just making referrals and connections to somebody who's done it before you um, or get little groups together. So we'd be happy to help. Yeah, don't reinvent the wheel, learn what, what others have pulled off, and then you have to obviously adapt it for your own situation. But um, 
have a good plan, really know the building that you're going into, having a plan for what's going on with the building you're leaving, set it up in a set of steps so it feels doable. Well, we don't have a building in sight yet. Okay. Right. Yeah, and I think- Partly because we don't have enough money to make a down payment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, to use a pretty overused phrase right now, but it's a good one. Uh, what is the why of, of doing this? You know, is it, if, it's, if it's simply to have, and this is where I get into, it's really important to have a strategic plan before you go out on a major fundraising mm -hmm. venture. You know, what, what's gonna be, besides having, you could rent a storage space for all your stuff, right? So are you, the question is, is it gonna, is a building gonna allow you to be open more? to show, to have yeah. more exhibits, that sort of thing. So to be really clear about articulating that. Yeah, that, so, was, that was the point of it, to have a place good. to display uh, and create educational exhibits, which we right. can't do uh, very well where we are now. Right. And we do have enormous amount of interesting stuff. Neat. Yeah. Good, that's great that you've already thought of that but we're a little, <laughs> a little organization. Mm, it's hard, hard. Yeah. Well, feel free to call us if you haven't already and we can talk about some next steps. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. And just know <laughs> when, I, when I, I, I talk with very small nonprofits, you know, we are up against our, our community-based nonprofits. Um, we do not have a natural constituency like your faith uh, community or your, or your alma mater. Um, we are really looking at our local communities and the in, within that people who are interested in history and historic preservation. And then we also are up against, again, to pick on Dartmouth, I bet they have 150 people in their development office. And then even more in their communications department. So we are, you know, we, we can't compete with that. So we have to do, um, we have to, it, I've heard one development person call it, it's kind of a slog. You know, we have to do it one by one, individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, find them and then cultivate them and really bring them in. Keep taking your vitamins. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I have a question, please. Um, I've seen where you're talking and I've talked with you before in, in other training sessions I've been in where you're talking about looking at your organization for your um, beginning donations and all of that in your circle. How do you entice uh, and what do you put out there for these people to become members? I mean, we have our organization officers and everything. And I'm thinking when you say looking at your group, you're looking at those that are following you. So how do you entice members what do you offer them in my situation my building is not standing i'm trying to get it reconstructed so what can i offer for incentive to become a member of my organization so i have that base to tap yeah that's that is an excellent question and i would um ask a, a question which is why do you have members versus donors and i think that's an important question and maybe there's something about historical societies or groups that that is different that i might not be aware of but some organizations set themselves up as membership organizations but then don't have anything to offer their members mm -hmm. when maybe what you could do is transfer that over to annual fund donors but your your bigger question is how do i get how do i get people to give the first time Mm. Right. And uh, that is really looking at um, trying to expand your base. I mean, there, there are things like purchasing mailing lists and really mm -hmm. making a case okay. for uh, now those those usually that first mailing usually loses money. So it's a risk um, unless you do it as cheaply as you can, um, meaning all in house um, using volunteer labor. Um, which I've certainly done my share of. And again, all political campaigns do that all the time. Um, so it's, it's trying to find new names. It's constantly asking people, who do you know who might be interested in? It's asking your current donors to give you, the, would you be willing to write somebody and ask them if they would join you in supporting us? 
Thank you. I've seen a lot of organizations just get really caught up in the member benefit issue, which I think keeps them from asking the questions that you were just posing, Betsy. Mm. Um, and not that it's bad to give members a benefit, but um, it, it, it can be a distraction, I think. Think about what's, a, what's, what's gonna help you get to your goals, I guess. Um, in terms of yeah, so I, I live in Concord and we support Red River Theaters and so we're members. Now I would give to them anyway because I like having a great movie theater in my community, but it's pretty cool that I get discounted tickets and things like that. Now, if you're a nonprofit who doesn't have that kind of option of giving somebody pretty cool benefits like a museum or a theater, then I'm not sure what the point of membership is. And in fact, I I'm working with a nonprofit right now on transferring their structure from membership to annual, just regular annual fund donors. We should um, wrap up pretty soon. I just wanted to, there was one other chat question I think is important. Um, well, they're all important. I just wanted to share Richard's out loud. I don't know if you've all read it yet about, um, it has to do with donors connecting to people projects. Um, Betsy, do you want to react to that some? Yeah, or? actually, it's interesting because people love to support bricks and mortar projects. And the reason is because they can point to it and say, I helped support that. So it's a very tangible thing. It's actually, in many ways, easier to raise money for land conservation or um, a bricks and mortar project than it is for an ongoing social service organization. Uh, the, the point is, you always need to say why, tell why it's important to the people in the community. So land con I, I've done a bunch of land conservation campaigns, and it's it's always particularly for local communities. It's always great to talk about. Well, when this is done, you'll be able to walk with your kids on this trail and we'll have guided walks and the space will never become uh, a, a dollar store. Um, so, but I really like your point about, is there a way to create viable community programs or work in the schools that would qualify? Because that's the ongoing fundraising. And that's also the ongoing lasting impact is what mm. are your programs? And this is what I was asking uh, Stephanie about in terms of your the why of why you need a building, you know, who's gonna see it? What benefit are they gonna get? Why is it important that the community support this for the, for the long term? Because presumably it's not just buying a building, it's then gonna be needing to support it going forward. Right. So okay. what, what is gonna be the positive impact on the people in your community? Because otherwise, why do you need a building even if it's really pretty? And I know, and I, I know Jennifer supports that. That's why <laughs> I was just bold enough to say that. <laughs> it has to be an important part of your community. Very much so. Well, thanks for being an important part of this little community today for the last hour, Betsy, and sharing your um, great facts and great um, knowledge and experience over time. I hope, and all of you for joining us and asking your questions. Um, Hope you take away a, a few new tidbits and maybe some ideas about priorities to get you started or keep you going. Um, know that we're here for you at the Preservation Alliance. Um, happy to respond to calls and emails um, about your project after today, of course, and, and every day. Um, we're gonna send a really a follow up with some links to some other fundraising related sources. Um, and hope you'll respond when I send that just to a really quick survey to help shape what we do next in terms of future programming. Um, uh, thank you to all of you who are already supporting the Preservation Alliance. This is a fundraising session, right? So I'm supposed to put in a plug, a plug for us too. Hope you'll continue to support the Preservation Alliance with annual fund, with a gift membership, any way that feels right. Um, about 80% of our dollars come from people like you. So hope you can support us as you support your local projects so we can do more for you. And um, keep it up. Uh, good luck with what you're working on. Stay safe and healthy. And thanks again for joining us today.